Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's lovely to see you all. I'm going to start by reading Proverbs 20, verse 12, um, which says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. And I want you to see today that that is utterly true. There is absolutely no doubt that you're dealing here with creation by God himself. Um, just to say this, that when we use a design argument, this is a sort of uh, a caveat, because when you do design talks, which is what this is, obviously, um, people will try to argue that you're using a God of the gaps idea. But as is often said by others who do these types of talks, it is not that what, it's not what we don't know which is really going to be the issue here. It's what we do know which points to design. In other words, it's like an onion. Every time you peel the onion, you find more and more and more detail. And in fact, we're going to see that here because we're going to go through a number of levels which will indicate tremendous design. So I would stress that to you, and it's a point worth remembering, that when people who are naturalists, atheists, try to accuse us of simply appealing to ignorance, it's actually totally the other way around. It's what we know which actually shows design. And the inference always, as we should say, in any scientific investigation is to the best explanation. And the best explanation I'm going to suggest to you is that there is a brilliant mind behind the design of the ear. We need to, first of all, work out a little bit in our minds what is sound. And I'm aware that I'm speaking to a general audience, so I'm not going to presume that, you know, you've got PhDs and all sorts of degrees in various subjects. I'm going to try and make this such that we can all follow. So I'm going to give you a few minutes on what is sound, then I'm going to say, how do we hear? You say, well, we know how we hear. Well, actually, that's the issue. You may be surprised as to how we hear. And running through this is the principle of irreducible complexity, which I won't do a separate item on. I will just simply be constantly referring to this issue. That in irreducible complexity means that the whole system can only work if all the component parts are working together. That's a very important definition. The whole system will only work when everything which that system is composed of is working in harmony and in sympathy. Does that sort of make sense? We call it in the science debates that we have with naturalists, and of course people get upset for those who are opposing us, uh, the principle of irreducible complexity. Michael Behe coined it when he was talking about the bacterial flagellum, which is a well-known example, which I'm not going to talk about here because people have tried to put counter-arguments, but there are actually counter-arguments back. So with all these devices, there is this principle of irreducible complexity. So please understand that it's not just complexity. It is the principle of irreducible complexity. So we're not sort of, people might say, well, given them a few more decades, we'll begin to understand how this could have gradually combined together. But actually, that's not the, the point. You could have a million universes, and it will never happen in our universes, or our universe, because I don't believe there is more than one universe. You'll never get something working like this unless everything is working together. What is sound? Well, sound is vibration of molecules in air. And if you've got a tuning fork, which is sending pressure waves through the air, eventually they will hit um, something or else they, they will be bouncing back the sound. And this is coming to something which is receiving the sound. So basically, that's going on whenever we're using sound. I'm using sound now and the sound is actually disturbing the air. If you were to take all the air out of this room, apart from the small little difficulty that you wouldn't be able to breathe and you'd be dead, um, but apart from that, you wouldn't be able to hear. Well, there's various reasons you might not be able to hear, as I've just said, but you get the point. So molecules of nitrogen and oxygen 
and there are other trace species, but it's mainly nitrogen and oxygen, are bouncing against each other, like, think of it like billiard balls, and sending a signal all the way through the air. So you've got what we call a compression, and the technical term is then a rarefaction. That sounds a complicated word, it just simply means spreading out. So you've got pushing together and spreading out, and that is travelling like a wave all the way through from my larynx to your ears, and that's what's going on as we uh, make sound. Sound has a frequency. If you're not familiar with frequency, think of the idea of pitch, because some of you are probably musical, and you're more familiar with the idea of a pitch, which is why I've put here a piano keyboard down here, so you get the idea. But of course, those of us who are more into engineering, we're familiar with the idea of HZ, which is just a unit. It simply means cycles per second. How many cycles, how many reverberations there are back and forth per second? And a chap called Hertz gave his name to it. German, I think. Um, 20 cycles per second <laughs> It's down here, right? Now, 20 cycles per second is very, very low frequency. I can't hear that anymore, actually. I've tested my ears and I cannot hear 20. You'll probably hear 50, which is what goes on in the electricity cables, and sometimes when they're not working very well, you sometimes get a, a buzz from the electricity cables at 50. Speech is in this area, so roughly in the middle is 4,000, but it goes down to, easily down to hundreds of cycles per second for my sort of speech as a, 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 as a male. Um, and then a female's voice will go a lot higher generally, depends obviously what our voices are. And then when we're born, we actually can hear right up to 20,000 cycles per second. I, I've got news for you though, even in your teens, you're beginning to lose that upper register. And if you were to test yourself, we'll do an experiment in a moment, you'll find that you generally, people generally cannot hear in the last few thousand cycles per second in their 20s and when they're getting really old like me I'm sort of saying across the table what did you say love you know and <laughs> and she might say well it's selective hearing because I want to get out of the washing up or whatever it might be but uh, <laughs> there is all sorts of uh, variation of course with people but generally we tend to lose the upper register Sound also has amplitude. Amplitude is a little bit e harder to understand. Amplitude is simple. Now, it, if you are an engineer here, you're going to immediately say to me, that's wrong because you just said that the waves are going like this. Well, we've just plotted it like that just so that you can get a feel for what's going on. The pressure is going up and then it's going down, right? That's what I'm plotting there. And if the pressure is going wildly up, then it's high amplitude. If it's a small amplitude, then that is as drawn there. Um, the way we measure that is by saying how, how much of the uh, atmospheric pressure um, we, are, we are varying, basically. And you can see here that this is absolutely minuscule what I'm doing now in my normal speech. Because this is somewhere in the region of a millionth, right? 10 would be, or 20 would be a millionth, or in that region, of the 100,000 pascals, because that's basically a pascal, it's roughly 100,000 pressure in this room. That's the static pressure, right? Static pressure is basically what changes when you go up in an aircraft. As you go up in an aircraft, that pressure goes down and down and down, and boy, do your ears feel it, particularly when you're coming down again, because the captain has, captain has to make sure that he gets the cabin pressure roughly at this value, but he never quite gets it right, and your ears feel it. People have sometimes more sensitive ears than others, and people are doing this and needing, mouth, needing sweets in their mouths in order to clear the passages. So, but we're not talking about static pressure, we're actually talking about variations like this, cyclically in pressure. And as I say, this is about a millionth, but the speech I'm using here 
is some, you may have heard the term decibels, and it's somewhere in this region, 40 to 60 decibels. And that's, that's measured logarithmically. You don't need to worry too much about it, but you may have heard of decibels. Uh, a jet engine at 100 meters, imagine a 100 meter race course, and you've got some F-35 blasting out, you know, about to take off. It's not a good idea to listen to, to too loud noises, but that would be at about 50 pascals. And that's 128 decibels. Very close to the threshold of pain, which is way up there, 65 pascals. So ears have a massive range of hearing. This is 2 to 20 thousandths of a pascal, right up to almost 100 pascals. Not that we would really want to hear that. Um, I would just say to you, be careful, rock concerts come somewhere here. It's getting dangerous. It's getting into the difficult area. And I'm going to refer to that later. If you listen to very loud music, you're in danger of damaging your ears. So there is actually a lesson here. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be Beethoven being played at uh, 120 decibels, but I don't think they usually do that. But whatever it is, just be careful. How do we hear? Well, we hear, of course, using these things. We've got two of them usually, although we may smile at my comment there. I've actually met people with one ear, and the whole of the face is distorted. And uh, they've listened to my talk on hearing, and they've appreciated what I've been saying, because um, it, it really does help having two ears, because two ears enable you to roughly work out where the sound is coming from. For many years, people were wondering what this outer bit was and why it was shaped like it is. It's technically called the oracle. And it would be this bit that Peter cut off and the Lord healed at the arrest in the garden. So it's an interesting point that the Lord was dealing with these ears even when he was facing the cross, which I find very moving, actually, that the Lord was still doing miracles all the way up to the end when he bled and died on the cross. Of course, it wasn't the end. He rose again wonderfully, um, but you get my meaning. So this is the oracle, the outer ear flap, we would tend to call it. And this is not just any old shape. The shape is actually, for a long time, people weren't quite sure what the shape was, but then they realized that it actually funnels sound into the middle ear, which is here. Now the, this is an interesting little experiment. If you put your hand over your ears, you will notice immediately that the sound sounds different. And the reason is that you are gathering lots of other frequencies, or if you prefer the term pitch, you provide, you're, you're actually gathering in many other bits of pitch or frequency which really are not appropriate for you as a human being because your ear is designed in order to gather in particularly frequencies which are in the speech range, which is why when you, some of us, not that I'm very good at it, I'm not so good at this, but some people, they can go into a crowded room and they can hear a conversation going right on the other side of the room. Why? Because our ears are tuned in to speech into that thousands of, roughly in the region, centered in the 4,000 cycles per second. So we block out, or the ear doesn't tend to magnify the other frequencies. So people have done some work on that. Just to say that reptiles, supposedly the mammal ear or the mammalian ear, which is really what we're talking about, they say came from reptiles, but they just have, a, have uh, really the ability to sense vibrations through their skulls. And they can actually hear quite a wide range of frequencies, but they're just hearing, vi hearing vibrations. They're not really hearing in the way that we hear, because we're going to now look at something else that goes on, which is the magnification facility which is due to three little bones in the middle ear. 
So we're going to move from the outer ear and we're going to move to the middle ear. But I need to say one last thing before we move on. Because remember I said that there is an ear canal, which is the bit going in from the outer oracle here into the middle ear, which I'm about to talk to. Um, that outer, the, this ear canal, which I'm now referring to, you can regard a little bit like a tube. If I've got this bottle here and I blow over it, it makes a note. It's got a resonant frequency, a natural frequency. Everything's got a natural frequency. Sometimes, though, the frequencies are a bit blurred because other things are vibrating as well. But if I get this table, that's making a number of notes. There is, if you were to analyze that sound, it would be composed of a frequency due to the vibration that way, to the vibration the other way, and all of these things start vibrating and make a noise. So every object has a natural frequency. So much so, and you might ask, why am I speaking anyway on acoustics? It's because I had to look at these things when I was looking at engines, and I spent many decades looking at pressure waves interacting for me in my area with flames. Well, I'm not talking about flames in this talk. I'm talking about just anything vibrating. And I'm astonished when I now begin to apply this discipline to the ear. Let me just explain, though, what happens with a glass. If you get the right frequency, you can actually shatter a glass. If you get the right frequency in an aircraft engine, you can get a blade vibrating and you've lost it in less than a millisecond. And that's happened on a number of occasions. Even with the best company in the world, Rolls-Royce, they have lost engines. And there was a famous case once where an A380, big double-decker plane, the Rolls-Royce engine lost a blade and it went through the control surfaces on one of the wings uh, when it was out in Australia. And it almost crashed, but uh, the pilot managed to get it down again. Here's another example of resonance. This is a famous example where the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the Second World War in America was vibrating and it uh, actually crashed. I always want to know what happened to that poor chap on the vehicle there, but nobody's ever <laughs> told me so. But that was natural frequencies. In that case, it was the wind causing the natural vibration of the bridge. They hadn't done their homework properly, and it was a torsional frequency. It was doing this, as you saw, and it collapsed. And of course, a guitar is another illustration. Why do I say this? Because when we come to a flute, as I've just mentioned, a bottle has a natural frequency, which is mainly due to the time it takes for the sound wave, the pressure wave, to go back and forth up here. Well, when you come to a flute, it's the same principle with a musical instrument. Um, if you've got a hole open there, it may form this type of wave. If the hole is closed, then it will form that type of wave, which is really half uh, a wavelength there, so it's a lower frequency. And the maths is here for actually working out different frequencies for different waveforms. When you come to the outer ear, the ear canal actually has, amazingly, Two centimeters is roughly this length, and it resonates roughly at, guess what? 4,000 cycles per second. Hardly surprising, is it? Because we are designed, this is human ears, we're not talking at this moment about dog ears and cat's ears, which I'll come to, but human ears, the natural fundamental frequency is consistent with human speech. Now, as I said, human speech does, isn't just at 4,000 cycles per second. It can be lower, even down to a few, uh, 500, 600 cycles per second, and go right up to somewhere in the region of uh, seven or 8,000. But the maths of all this is up here if you want to work that out. But 
it is very striking that both in the outer ear, the gathering of the sound, and also in the ear canal, everything is revolving around being able to appreciate speech. Now, if we were to test our hearing, I don't know whether you've ever been to one of these in, you know, I went with my grandchildren actually, took them around uh, in, uh, where was it? Somewhere in Yorkshire anyway. We took them to a place in Bradford, that's where it was. And we went to actually look at the science exhibits. And then one of the exhibits was testing your hearing. So you actually press this button and you, you actually indicated when you could hear the sound and they were actually raising the amplitude and this is a plot of what your hearing is against amplitude and you'll notice you probably can't see the numbers here but this is the 4000 that i mentioned okay so this is the region where you don't need much amplitude before you can hear because our ear is designed for human speech, and uh, I tested mine and uh, actually came not, not far away from that curve. And uh, it, it came out with an answer as to how old they thought you were. And I was rather pleased because it got my age a lot lower than it was. So I'm doing quite well. But no doubt you've seen things like that in displays. Now, a cat's ear has a bend in it, right? And their ears, of course, are not designed for listening primarily to speech. You could talk to your cat, it might even talk back to you, but I think it's a bit unlikely. But cats can hear a human voice. It's not that they can't hear it. It's just that their hearing, believe it or not, is tuned in to much higher frequencies. When I say much higher, a cat's ear can hear right up to 60,000 cycles per second. And it's well known also that dogs can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second, not quite as good as a cat. But you've heard of dog whistles, for those of you familiar with shepherding and using dogs to shepherd a flock of sheep, you've got a dog whistle which only they can hear but others can't. And the dog actually hears the sound right across a large distance and is able to obey the instructions. The reason I mention this is that this is the part of the talk up to here where I've been showing you that our ears are, yes, similar, but nevertheless in this area, and that is the resonant frequency different to other mammals. From this point on though, now coming to the middle ear, this is true for all mammals from this point on. So I need to bring you to this important point of the middle ear. The middle ear is these bones here, is really what signifies it. This is the eardrum, which is vibrating due to the signal coming in. And these are three little bones which are called the ossicle bones. This is a model of the ossicle bones. You might like to just pass this round. And when you finish looking at it, maybe you could give it to the camera gentleman who would probably like to just take a, a bit of a video of them. So these bones are incredibly small. They actually are the same size as when you were born as when you might die at 91. So they're the only bones in the human body which do not grow. This is the tympanic membrane here, and it's located at the end of the ear canal we were just talking about. It is actually transferring, these little bones are transferring the vibration which was in air, now it's in a membrane physically, and this is an amplification device which connects to the last bit which we're going to look at, which is the cochlea. So in thinking about the middle ear, this is a diagram of um, a dime from America, with the three little bones next to it. And this is the three little bones explained with their technical term, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Loosely, we call them the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Now, these three bones are reckoned by the naturalist and the evolutionist to actually have come from 
a reptile ear. Now, a reptile ear, as I mentioned earlier, only has this bone, and it's a long bone, and it simply just pushes against a membrane here, which we're coming to, which leads to the cochlea. They don't have these other bones. These other bones, we're going to see, are an amplification system. And when it's suggested that a reptile ear has changed through stages to a mammalian ear, they make the proposition that these bones have come from the rear bone of the upper jaw and the rear bone of a lower jaw of a reptile. Now, that reptile could have been something, they're not saying it was a crocodile, but imagine it was a crocodile, right? Well, have you looked at a crocodile's mouth recently? Don't get too close. But uh, if you look at a, rock, a crocodile's mouth of an adult, it's way out here, isn't it? And those bones of the jaw are big. If you look at a tiny little embryo of a crocodile when it's born, it's this size, right? In other words, the bones of their jaw grow as all the other bones do. So you've got a massive issue immediately when you propose that the reptile jaw, right, the rear part of the jaw, because there's, there's more than one bone in the reptile jaw, the rear part of the upper jaw and the rear part of the lower jaw have actually moved, it's suggested, and become these two bones. There's yet another problem. The shape of these bones is incredibly important, as we will see in a little video I will play in a moment. This is um, a 1P piece, which we've still been using, as you know. We're not using euros. So, um, but these are the three little bones with the size of a 1P piece. I'm not quite sure what it would be in your currency, but you get the idea that it's jolly, jolly small, and I've shown you um, uh, some idea of the size in the, the, the cochleas which are being passed, sorry, not the cochlea, the um, ossicle bones which are being passed around. This then leads us into the cochlea. Now, I need to, before I get to that cochlea, though, show you this video. But the reason I'm putting this in here is to show you that these three little bones, their whole purpose is to take the motion, which was of the eardrum here, through into the cochlea, which is full of fluid. The cochlea doesn't have air in it, it has liquid. And this is demonstrated here as we just play this video clip, so hopefully you'll get the idea. Here's the eardrum vibrating. This is technically called the tympanic membrane. This is the malleus, this is the incus, and this is the stapes. Now you see, this is a very delicate arrangement. You've got ligaments here holding these bones in place, but not holding them rigid. They're able to move. And this is actually an amplification system. This is a large area here, times a relatively small movement. This is a small area times a large movement. And roughly, the multiplication of the movement times the area is approximately the same in both parts of those bones. In other words, from an engineering point of view, or specifically from an energy conservation point of view, hardly any energy is lost whatsoever moving from this vibration through to that vibration. When engineers look at this system, they are absolutely amazed as to the efficiency of the system. There is no other system like it in all of nature for actually having such an efficient transmission, which basically moves this small motion to basically a piston. Now, why has that become a piston? Now, this is the reason. If you're actually dealing with liquid, liquid is heavier, is denser than air. If you were trying to get some sort of signal from the air into, let's say, water, you'd have great difficulty. Supposing somebody is swimming underwater and you want to shout to them, problem, you know, it's, there's a, some, some, some obstruction in the way, would they be able to hear you? And the answer is no. 
Because when you speak to the water, it, the vibrations, the pressure vibrations, just simply bounce off again. So we call it, the technical term is, impedance. It is impeded, right? You can actually measure what the impedance is of these various surfaces. And if the person is in the water and wants to shout back to you, that's not a good idea when you're swimming underwater, but supposing he made a noise of some kind, you probably wouldn't be able to hear it. You might just hear a little thud, but very little would be transmitted from the water through to the air. Well, this is just staggering. In other words, the impedance is very, very large for most of the systems we make. The impedance here is virtually zero. It's just fantastic what's going on here because this piston is so, this whole system is so efficient. There's very little loss of energy. There's a bit of loss, obviously, because this is a little bit of friction at each of these joints, but it's minuscule. So, let me now just move on now to what's going on in the cochlea because this is just, if you think that was fantastic, this next bit will blow your mind because you've got here a, a piston which is going in, it's just showing it slowly so you can see the idea. And as this goes in, notice this membrane is coming out. Now why is that happening? Ah, we need to think. If you've got a, a bicycle pump full of air, right, and you push the handle down, you, can you push it down? You can actually, because you can compress air. We use it all the time in engineering. You can push air down, right? You could squeeze air. I just said to you earlier, the very fact that air can be squeezed means that we can talk in air, right? Now, if I take that same bicycle pump, push the handle down, put the end into water, pull the handle up, yes, you've got something like a water pistol, but forget that for a moment, right? If you put your finger over the end of the bicycle pump, get your hand and try to push the handle in, would you be able to push it in? And the answer is, what do you think? Would you be able to push it in? You've got liquid now in the bicycle pump. You wouldn't be able to, you are actually correct. Because liquid is essentially incompressible. You can, there's a tiny amount you can push, but it's essentially non-compressible. You cannot push liquid around, push liquid in. That's the whole point of a hydraulic pump. If you want to lift a 10 ton truck, you've, you've got liquid, it's usually oil because you don't want to have rusty pumps, do you? So, and you pump the device and the liquid's got to go somewhere, so it's got to push up this 10 ton truck. That's how a hydraulic pump works. Okay, well, this is amazing here because you've got just this system going on with this, um, with this going in. You'll see that the membrane was coming out. So the membrane was coming out, why? Because you've got liquid in there and the liquid's got to have somewhere to go. If you didn't have that other membrane, you would actually blow the cochlea. So that is an immediately a mark of design. Any engineer looking at that would say, well, this chap knew what he was doing. He's actually made sure that the hard shell, because the cochlea is like a cockle shell, hence the name cochlea, is actually not going to be burst. And when the air comes in, it comes in through one duct, and which is um, uh, the vestibular, sorry, the tympanic duct, and then it comes back through the vestibular duct. So it's coming in through one duct, then it comes to an end here, and then it comes round and comes up another duct. Now, this is an old video, but it just illustrates one other point. So I'm going to play this. This is another video which illustrates the same point. There's the um, round window, which is pushing out when this one pushes in. But you'll notice here that, I re remember I said that that was full of fluid. There is another membrane in here which is vibrating in the fluid. So the liquid, remember, has nowhere else to go. It has to just simply be pushed around. And as it gets pushed around, 
we're going to find something amazing happening. And in order to explain this, I've got to unwind the cochlea. So what I've done here is this tiny, tiny cochlea. If you look at the stapes that I've shown on the ossicle bones going around, the, the cochlea is so small, you'd barely be able to actually see it. But you can just see it if I haven't got a cochlea to show you. But, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a little bit of the order of the size of the stapes on those bones going around. So we've unwound it. Now I'm going to tell you the tale as to what goes on. As the mem tympanic membrane has been vibrating, remember the motion has been com coming through these three little bones. This is tapering. The cochlea is actually tapering. Think of this now like an xylophone. You know what an xylophone is? Maybe the, some of you won't own up to the fact that you play it with your children, all right? And you've got a big bar out here for the low notes, and you've got a small bar out here for the high note. So when you play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, how I wonder what you are. And you can do that all on eight notes, OK? So that is a very simple principle, which is that you have a bigger bar for the lower notes. The, this cochlea has got exactly the same principle. The basilar membrane, which I showed you waving in the previous video, is this. If this frequency is at, say, 400 cycles per second, which is not far away from middle A, the A above middle C, OK? So if you think of the pitch A, la, that the orchestra plays as they're tuning up, that la, right? Imagine that A being played. As that note is being played in your ear, your ear is also vibrating at that little frequency, right? Literally, if the orchestra is playing A, your ear is playing A in this cochlea. If it's C, which is 256, it's just a bit below. If it's top A, then it's the one above here, and so on and so forth. Every bit of that membrane is sensitive to one and only one frequency. This is an incredible, and I'm going to use a, a term here, it's a frequency analyzer. It's an instantaneous pitch analyzer, if you prefer the term pitch. So any sound coming in is immediately split into frequencies. And if you're an engineer here, you may appreciate the term that this is basically going into the frequency plane from the time plane. And if you're not an engineer, don't worry about the terms I'm using. But essentially, an engineer likes to sometimes look at things in terms of not what the signal looks like in time, but what it looks like in terms of frequencies, right, or pitch. And he wants to say, what are the frequencies involved in this sound that I've just heard? And this is an instantaneous frequency analyzer. And I find that staggering. Another term would, that an engineer would use, it's an analog device. It immediately picks up what is going on in terms of the sound. Let me play this video, which will help you to understand this a bit more. <laughs>
So what's happening in the cochlea is somewhat like a little gremlin playing an organ in your ear. It's, that's the way to think of it. So every time a particular note is being played, your ear is vibrating in sympathy with that note. Now, speech is what we're primarily designed with our ears to listen to. And speech doesn't just come in with one frequency. I'm using all sorts of frequencies at the moment. As I get excited, and I do sometimes in what I'm saying, then the higher frequencies will get involved. Or if I'm just putting you all to sleep with a low frequency, it'll be monotonic, just at the 200, 300 cycles per second, you know, and that will be that one vibrating. But when I'm speaking and I'm really getting into it, all sorts of other frequencies will be being used. In fact, when we say a word, a whole range of different frequencies are involved all at once. So we're not talking about one frequency only at one time. We're talking about many frequencies all at once. And that means that the basilar membrane has the capacity to take all these frequencies all together. And of course, your ear is designed for music. Let's just think about certain notes. I've cheated here. I've got a, a sound generator from the, uh, a, a bit of software to generate sound. But... So I've already done this experiment, but we could look at the way the sound magnitude is for each frequency for a particular piece of music. And this is a keyboard here, so this is similar to a piano keyboard, and this is amplitude. So different amplitudes for different notes are plotted on that curve. Now if we play a piece of music, This is what's literally happening with your ear. Different frequencies are coming through and being vibrated on the basilar membrane. So this is a particular piece which I quite enjoy, where the main sound is the sound of the violins that you can hear here. But you'll notice that there's a lot of other frequencies up here which are being excited as well. Because remember when I said about a flute, it's got other harmonics which can also be played which are in sympathy with the main fundamental frequency. So we have the capacity to listen to music, which is one of the big, biggest evidences of design because if we were just evolving from some reptile creature, then why would we need this extra over-design of the ability to listen to beauty, which is basically what's happening with music. Our ears are particularly designed for listening to very sensitive changes in the frequency. Well, if you thought that was wonderful, let me just explain something which I can anticipate coming back. Because people might say, but this, this is also true of other mammals like dogs and cats. Well, let me illustrate with Stuart Burgess, who has a daughter who's not well. And he gave her this chihuahua. And when his daughter, Naomi, plays the piano, the chihuahua actually starts singing. But I tell you, it doesn't sing in tune. That is typical of some dogs, that they will somehow hear the music and try and respond to it. But they don't quite get the notes right. But, so they do, it's not to say that other mammals do not appreciate music. In, I don't know whether appreciate's the right word, or recognise music. It's just that they don't have the ability to then respond as a human being does, most of us, not everybody, but most people can sing in response to music, recognize the sound, and actually sing the same note as what is being played. I'm developing a talk on the voice, which will be something I will eventually be speaking on. 
And this is a marvel which shows again that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. So the difference with humans is that they can hear the sound and they can actually sing it. They can sing the sound uh, um, back. So just to summarize, we're almost through, but these three little bones are an amazing mechanical engineering uh, marvel. We've got this extra membrane which has to push out as this one pushes in. Various frequencies are excited by any particular sound. We've got one last bit to show, and that's this. What happens then after the membrane has been vibrating? Because depending where the vibration is, the vibrations will be uh, very, very sm uh, high frequencies at this end, and then very low frequencies at this end. These are the ones which are uh, generally kept all the way through to old age, but I'm already losing this bit, as you probably recognized. Well, this leads us now to this last part. We've gone from vibration in air to mechanical vibration of the membrane, the tympanic membrane. Then we went to the mechanical vibration of the three little bones. Then we went to vibration in liquid. Think of it as water, but it's not water. And we had the basilar membrane vibrating. But now we've cut through the cochlea and we're looking at the organ of corti, which runs alongside this basilar membrane. So the basilar membrane, right, think of it stretching all the width of this room, right? And this basilar membrane is vibrating, but how does that vibration now get to the brain? That's what we're considering. Well, in one of the canals, the three canals, remember I mentioned the tympanic canal, as the liquid comes down, then it comes back up through here and it hits the other window because the liquid has somewhere to, has to have somewhere to go. This canal is full of an electrically charged fluid. This is, when people first realise this, I don't think they, you know, it, 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 it really makes you speechless as to what's going on because you're moving now into chemical energy, having started with mechanical energy. So this is an electrically charged chamber, a bit like in your car battery, right? I'm not suggesting that you can refill your ear with car battery fluid, please don't try that. But this is electrically charged and it's full of ions, I-O-N-S, ions. And next to the tympanic membrane, sorry, next to, I beg your pardon, the basilar membrane, is this organ of corti. There is another membrane which I won't go into here, but the organ of corti is being pushed up every time the basilar membrane is being pushed up, okay? And remember there is a fluid here and it's charged and there is tiny little hairs on the top of this basilar membrane. Those hairs come in pairs. They are called stereocilia. They are actually the same type of thing as is used in the balance mechanism, which I won't be able to talk to you about in this talk, which also is connected to the inner ear. But these hairs are the mechanism by which you are going to get the sound coming from the basilar membrane through to your brain. So these hairs come in pairs, and they look somewhat like this. Here's the hairs which move over every time there is a disturbance. I'm going to blow that picture up so that you can see it. And I'm going to show it to you here. These hairs, once they move over, actually cause another intricate mechanical mechanism to be instigated. Once these hairs move over, there is a spring attached to one hair, which pulls literally a trap door open on an adjacent hair. You are dealing here with something so small though, that these hairs 
are such that 72 of them would get into the width of a human hair. My hair is so precious, if you don't mind, I won't pull it off. But if you were to pull one of your hairs off, stretch it out in front of you, you could get 72 of these stereocilia in the width of one hair. Now we're talking about at the tip of one of those hairs is a spring, the other end of which is attached to a trapdoor. Every time these stereocilia move over, then ions, one by one, molecules basically, go down the hair and they excite the nerve which runs at the bottom of every single frequency that we're talking about. So there is a whole set of, sp they're, they're called spiral ganglion nerves, which are gathered together for every single frequency, except once you get up to about 20,000 cycles per second, they go about in every three, because people can't resolve the difference between 15,000 and 15,001. Nobody would be able to do that, even a person with perfect pitch. But down at 300, 400 cycles per second, it literally is just about every, free, every uh, cycle per second. Now, when you get the magnitude of what is being done here, I think we all have to agree that the verse that I started with is true. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, which of course I haven't dealt with the eye, the Lord has made even both of them. The Lord has done something absolutely wonderful in making your ear. You have the ability to distinguish far more than is necessary if you were just built to survive with a few grunts to your female, or the other way around, to go and open the fridge door and get some food out because you need to survive. We're built far more than just for survivability. We're built for the ability to communicate words which are made of very high frequency sounds. That is why we are different to reptiles. And indeed, you might say, well, why bother with dogs having this type of hearing? Well, but dogs actually need to understand very high frequency sounds as well. Have you ever noticed that your dog will hear your, you know, if, you, if, 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 if one of the member is out in a car, he will hear you coming right down at the other end of the road because he's got super hearing. Dogs have very good smell, but they also have very good hearing. And it's similar also with other creatures. They can hear exceptionally well. I need to finish, I've been told, and I'm going to finish. But I want to just mention one last bit, and that's this. Where do those, where do those nerves go? Well, they actually go from the cochlea, as I've been saying, when this is a slice through the cochlea, through the spiral ganglion, and they go to the brain stem and eventually they end up either on the left side or the right hand side of the brain. The left hand side of the brain is the part of the brain which is more to do with logic. The right hand side of the brain is more to do with art and music. When those signals are coming from the ear, there is a very quick passage between both sides of the brain working out whether this is speech or whether it's music. If it's speech, it ends up exciting the left side of the brain. If it's music, it ends up exciting the right side of the brain. And if it's the voice of your beloved, I'm sure it excites both sides of the brain. And so it should. You see, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And everything indicates that when we consider carefully the science of hearing. The evolutionist insists that the rear bones of both the upper and the lower jaw actually moved and became the malleus and the, uh, the uh, incus in mammals 
on mammalian hearing. I disagree, not only because the scripture tells me that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but the science actually shouts it. It's not what I don't know. Remember I started with that? It's what we do know which confirms this wonderful truth. So may I encourage you to actually listen and listen to the voice of God. I end on a spiritual point. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke everything into existence. Psalm 33 tells me that. He also demonstrated his creative power in Matthew 11 and many other places it's recorded. Here he's talking to John the Baptist and he says, tell him that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. The Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated his creative ability and his deity by doing these wonderful miracles. There's one case where the deaf and dumb man, he says, he, it says he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said, if after that is be opened, and straightway his ears were opened. He fulfilled what the scriptures say, that when Christ came, he would do these amazing miracles. May I encourage you, therefore, not to actually block your ears to the truth. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? That's the Lord. And it says in the scriptures, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Now, you will say that that's spiritual. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But it's not just spiritual. Because it says in John chapter 5, verses 25 onwards to about 28 and 29, let me just read this as I close because this is a fearful thing to realize that the voice of God literally is going to be heard again. And I find this a tremendous challenge to my own soul. Marvel not at this, verse 28 of John chapter 5. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Which leads me to a final point which I will develop more when I speak on the voice, every person's voice is unique. Even twins. One twin will have a different voice when it's analysed to the other. Think of, think of that. So when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke when he was here, all of nature had to recognise that voice. When he spoke to the Lake of Galilee, it had to obey. Even an inanimate water had to obey. Now, think of what that means at the end. When Lazarus, who was dead, heard the voice, he didn't hear it, as it were, but when the dead body heard it, he had to come to life. So John 5 is basically saying that when that voice is heard, it has to be obeyed. And I want you to realise that if we are not going to be judged, we should not be like it says in Romans 1 where we are deaf to the voice of God. All of us must recognise that the hour is coming when the dead shall hear his voice. And we, if we want to avoid that judgement to come, we must listen to God's voice now and recognise that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Creator, but he's the Saviour and bled and died that we might be forgiven. Thank you.